rainforest once covered 12% of Earth's land surface. Man has already destroyed half of this, mainly in the last 30 years. Every year, an area the size of Britain is destroyed, which means 100 acres are lost every minute. As a result, it has been estimated that up to 50 different wild species are made extinct every day. If current rates of deforestation continue, all accessible forests could be gone within 35 years, and man will have been responsible for the greatest extinction of living things since the ecological catastrophe which wiped out the dinosaurs. This area of rainforest has been cleared and left to dry out. Later, the farmers will set fire to it. This is slash and burn agriculture, where the entire nutrient store of the forest is cashed in once and for all by turning it into ash. In a couple of seasons, this nutrient store will be exhausted, the crops will fail, and the farmer will have no option but to clear more forest to survive. Traditionally, Forest farmers cleared only small areas, which were then left to regenerate. But now, so many people are moving into the forest that large areas are cleared and there is no time for the forest to regenerate. Clearing the forest by burning is responsible for 70% of rainforest destruction worldwide. Banana trees, a typical crop. You can see how much of the soil is now exposed where formerly the dense forest vegetation protected the soil from the damaging effects of the tropical sun and rain. Now, any useful organisms left in the soil will be killed by the sun, and the soil will be baked into hard laterite where plants will not grow, and the rains will leach out the nutrients and erode the soil away into the rivers. It may seem a shame to be destroying the world's richest ecosystem to grow cabbages, but the people moving into the forest are not making any money out of it, they are literally living from hand to mouth every day, living at a subsistence level. The reason for the destructive migration of people into rainforest regions is not so much overpopulation, but inequitable land tenure. In Latin America, 93% of the land is owned by only 7% of the population. As the big landowners in the rich agricultural regions of the South began to mechanise and modernise their farms, the tenant farmers who were no longer required were evicted. Rather than make land reforms, the government chose to send the millions of landless peasants into the rainforest regions with the promise of land. The disastrous Polar Norris project was a direct result of this policy. With the financial aid of the World Bank, a road was built to open up the Amazon region of Rondonia to settlers. A massive area of rainforest has now been destroyed, and 8,000 Indians and 25 different groups are threatened with extinction. Meanwhile, due to the unproductivity of the land, the farmers are worse off than before. The World Bank now admit they made a mistake in funding the transmigration project and admit that it has led to the pointless destruction of pristine forests with little benefit to anyone except perhaps the original landowners who wanted their tenant farmers moved on. Another reason why the government encouraged the migration is to secure a sovereign presence in the frontier zone. In the words of one Brazilian official, only when we are certain that the Amazon is inhabited by genuine Brazilians and not by Indians, only then will we be able to say that the Amazon is ours. To this end, the Indians, the indigenous people of the forest, have been persecuted. They have been shot, poisoned, bombed, and deliberately infected with diseases Survival International 
are expressly concerned with the plight of indigenous people, like the Amazon Indians, and are campaigning internationally on their behalf. When their crops fail, farmers can sell their abandoned land for about eight pence an acre to cattle ranchers. Through overgrazing, this land is soon rendered virtual desert, but it is easier and cheaper for ranchers to keep buying new land than to sustainably manage existing areas. Nearly all the ranches established in the Amazon before 1978 are now abandoned. The beef is grown largely for export for North America's fast food trade. Rainforest beef is used to make hamburgers, corned beef and pet food. North America buys South American beef because it is cheap. At less than half the price of domestically produced beef, its purchase helps offset inflation by reducing the price of a hamburger by five cents. Ironically, even with huge government subsidies, Amazon ranches seldom make a profit. Rainforest land is so unsuitable to grazing cattle that barely 50 pounds of meat per acre are produced in a year and no milk. By contrast, Northern Europe produces over 500 pounds of meat per acre and 1,000 gallons of milk. Land speculation alone motivates many ranchers to destroy the forest, since under Brazilian law, anyone who deforests an area of land owns it. Largely thanks to pressure from José Lutzenberger, Brazil's leading environmentalist, the Brazilian government has now not only frozen subsidies, but heavily fines ranchers caught burning the forest without a permit. The authorities police high-risk areas in helicopters using a satellite monitor system to locate the illegal fires. In December 1988, Chico Mendes, the president of the Rubber Tappers Union, was murdered by cattle ranchers for trying to defend the rights of the rubber tappers and the Indian Brazil nut collectors, whose forest and livelihood is being destroyed by the ranchers. By murdering their figurehead, Chico Mendes, the cattle ranchers hope to finally intimidate the rubber tappers out of the forest. Brazil's powerful landowning elite often hire gunmen and use murder to intimidate peasant farmers off their land. But this assassination made international news and created such an outcry that the authorities were pressurised not only to sentence the guilty ranchers, but also to concede to the rubber tappers' demands by setting up several extractive reserves. The largest being the Chico Mendes Reserve, of nearly one million hectares. An extractive reserve is a reserved area of rainforest which is exploited sustainably, for instance through the extraction of rubber and Brazil nuts. Far more money can actually be made by such sustainable extractive practices, by harvesting the forest for nuts, fruits, fibres, oils and latexes, than by logging for timber or converting the forest to pasture for cattle. Today, all over the world, people continue to risk their lives in defense of their rainforest home. In Venezuela, the Yanomani Indians now face extinction because their forest homeland is being invaded by thousands of illegal gold miners. The Yanomani are dying from diseases brought by the miners, such as malaria, TB and flu, to which they have no immunity. The mercury effluents from the mining have polluted the rivers, killing fish and destroying the Indian's water supply. Survival International are campaigning on behalf of the Yanomani, but if nothing is done, the entire Yanomani race may be totally wiped out within 10 years. Japan is responsible for 53% of all tropical hardwood imports, turning the rainforest into things like disposable chopsticks and cardboard boxes for TV sets, hi-fi and fridges. Japan has already decimated the Asian forests and is now looking to Brazil for logging concessions. Britain and America are the next largest importers of tropical hardwoods. 87,000 square kilometres of rainforest are felled for timber every year. Trees are either clear felled, it takes just one minute to reduce a giant tree to wood chips for chipboard, or logged selectively when only the most valuable timber is cut, about 15% of the trees. 
but even with selective logging, up to 60% of the surrounding forest is permanently damaged, and the roads which the loggers make open up previously inaccessible areas to settlers who will complete the process of destruction. Hardwoods in our local shops are almost certainly supplied with a direct expense of rainforests. Wood such as teak, mahogany, ebony, rosewood, maranti, iroko, obichi, sapili and greenheart. Rainforest trees are some of the fastest growing trees in the world and if harvested sustainably have the potential to provide an inexhaustive supply of high quality timber. But so far only 2% of tropical hardwoods entering this country have been identified as coming from a sustainable source. One of these few suppliers is the El Pan Natural Forest Management Project in northern Ecuador, which provides sustainably produced timber from the buffer zone around the Awa Indian Reserve. The project is successful because it operates within the boundaries of the forest's own mechanisms for perpetual self-renewal. Instead of clear felling, selected trees are cut in 100 meter wide strips, leaving the surrounding forest intact, so enabling natural regeneration. Instead of building roads and skidder tracks and using destructive heavy machinery, the timber is rolled by hand along wood pole ramps to a unique portable milling saw. This mill was specially designed by Trekker Saw International not only to be portable enough to be carried into the forest by hand, but also with very little wastage of wood to produce sawn timber of sufficient high quality for export. The timber is sold directly to the Ecological Trading Company, which ensures the Indians get a fair price. These same Indians used to work felling trees for logging companies and earned only $8 for each tree felled. Now, operating their own sustainably managed logging project, they can earn up to $600 a tree. The money provides funds for education, health care and general living requirements for the community. Here, the timber is being treated with fungicide. It will then be stacked to dry, ready to be taken out of the forest by pony. So eliminating the need to build roads and use heavy machinery for transport. The timber will be about 15% more expensive, but this seems a small price to pay for saving the rainforest from clear felling. If everyone refused to buy tropical hardwoods, unless they were certified as having been produced sustainably, then the timber trading companies will be forced by consumer demand to seriously attempt to manage their timber extraction in a sustainable manner and the terminal destruction they presently cause would finally come to an end. One reason why Latin America is cashing its forests in is to help pay back debt goes to the first world. This debt has arisen because third world countries are unable to pay the soaring interest rates on loans from the first world, which were granted as aid during the oil boom of the 70s. Brazil is the biggest debtor in the world, owing by 1988 a staggering $115 billion. But the third world is by no means entirely responsible for the debt crisis. In order to pay back the loans, foreign exchange must be gained through export. But even though the first world has encouraged an export-based economy in the third world, it is unwilling to pay a fair price for these. The third world is still a useful source of cheap commodities for the West. For instance, we pay a minimal price for raw timber coming from South America, perhaps $1,000 for the wood from one tree. We then process the wood into products like expensive furniture, toilet seats, parquet floors, yacht fitting, coffins, window frames, lampstands, doors and musical instruments by which time the value of that same tree may have increased up to $17,000. The first world is making far more money out of the tropical hardwoods than producer countries like Peru and Brazil. Europe is perpetuating this situation by putting a heavy import tax on any processed wood coming from the producer countries. 
which prohibits them from exporting anything other than raw timber. Ironically, Peru spends far more money importing processed wood than it can make from exporting raw timber. This wood is stacked in Puerto Maldonado, ready for export, just four and a half hours downriver from Tamapata Reserve. Large areas of forest in Ecuador are being destroyed to grow bananas for export to Europe. But the more bananas produced, the less we pay for them. Whilst bananas are often cheaper for us to buy than our own locally grown fruit, the people working in the plantations earn so little that many cannot afford to buy even basic foodstuffs. Furthermore, in spite of widespread malnutrition, prime agricultural land is used to grow cash crops like bananas, pineapples, coffee, tea, sugar and cocoa for export to the already well-fed first world because it is more lucrative than growing food for the local population. But even so, not enough money can be made through export to pay back the loans. Once a country is in debt, the International Monetary Fund implements stringent austerity measures to further maximise exports, creating even more pressure to cash in on resources like rainforests and cutting internal spending causing great hardship to the generally poor population, as cuts are made in the social services such as education and healthcare. International campaigning groups, like Friends of the Earth, are lobbying the banks to cancel third world debt, which they see as holding not only rainforest to ransom, but also the well-being of a huge majority of people who are already suffering from extreme poverty. <laughs> In Brazil, a massive industrial project called Grand Carajas is destroying an area of rainforest the size of Great Britain and France combined for mining iron ore, copper and aluminium bauxite for plantations and cattle ranches. Estimated to cost $62 billion, the project is being financed by the World Bank, Royal Dutch Shell, the EEC Development Fund, Japan and the USA. Brazil uses hydroelectricity to power its rainforest industry and Takurai Dam, featured in the film The Emerald Forest, was built to supply power for Karajas. Takurai is the fourth largest dam in the world, flooding six towns and 800 square miles of virgin rainforest and displacing over 3,000 Indians who used to live there. Building costs alone ran to $3 million a day. A new dam, planned at Altamira, was to flood 7,000 square kilometres of forest, creating the world's largest lake. The dam building was to be financed by a $500 million loan from the World Bank and several British banks. But in 1989, rainforest tribes gathered together at Altamira to protest against the destruction of their forest lands by dams. As a result of this historic Indian gathering and the international campaign by Friends of the Earth and other conservation groups in support of them, the banks were pressurised to cancel their proposal to fund the new dam building, stating instead that the money should be used for environmental protection schemes. This was a major victory in the fight to save rainforest, and for the forest Indians, whose voice is at last being heard all over the world. But dams in the Amazon are not only detrimental to the forests and the people who live there, they are an inefficient and expensive way to make electricity. The drowned trees decompose creating acids which corrode valuable machinery. And the oxygen content in the water is so reduced that fish still die for many miles down river. The dam fills with silt due to deforestation in the area. And mosquitoes carrying malaria and yellow fever breed in the shallow water. So a dam, which should operate for 60 years just to repay initial investments, may have to be half shut down in 25 years. The iron ore mined at Karajas is exported to Japan and Britain to supply our steel industry. Huge government tax incentives encourage the building of blast furnaces to smelt the ore into more valuable pig iron. But thousands of acres of rainforest are being destroyed to provide charcoal to fuel these blast furnaces. And the work conditions are so bad 
that many people die from painful respiratory diseases. Brazil is effectively going through the kind of industrial revolution Britain saw at the turn of the century, exploiting natural resources as fast as possible, with seemingly no thought for the environmental or social consequences. The first world, meanwhile, by investing in this industrialization, is effectively promoting rainforest destruction for the short-term profit of the already wealthy business elite who control their development. This investment does not seem to improve life for the generally poor population, who in Brazil may work for the legal minimum wage of £30 a month. Essentially, rainforests are the victim of the same short-sighted model for development which continues to destroy our own few remaining areas of natural habitat here in Britain. Rainforests are vanishing at a rate of 5% a year, which is exactly the same rate at which Britain's natural habitat is being lost. Brazil is simply following in our footsteps.